Bueno, como última plática de este coloquio está Jordan Lacey, eh, que es practicante creativo transdisciplinario e investigador de la Escuela de Diseño de la Universidad RMIT. Es autor de Sony Rupture, en un enfoque basado en la práctica para el diseño de paisajes sonoros. Bloomsbury 2016. Tiene varios artículos que exploran el papel de las instalaciones de sonido en la transformación de la vida urbana. Él está en el primer año él en, el, en esta él está en el primer año de la, una prestigiosa beca del Consejo de Investigación de Australia titulada Translating Ambience, diseño de sonido restaurador para paisajes sonoros urbanos. Originalmente música y artista de sonido, Jordan se ha centrado cada vez más en la creación de sitios de encuentro de entornos urbanos que podrían exceder las funciones típicas del día a día de la vida de la ciudad. Ha producido numerosas instalaciones de arte sonoro financiadas por socios gubernamentales y de la industria que buscan influir en los enfoques del diseño urbano. Thank you, Jordan. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, a few things. Um, firstly, I apologize that I don't speak any Spanish, so I will try to speak uh, slowly and clearly for the benefit of those uh, who um, who English is second, third, etc. language. Uh, a lot of Australians talk through their nose, but I will speak from my chest as I learned from Viv Corringham yesterday in our beautiful deep listening session. I want to thank uh, Professor Luz uh, Marie Sanchez who invited me to speak at the um, Acoustic Ecology Conference where Eric Leonardson did a keynote and that's what enabled me to be at this conference. Thank you to the organisers for accepting my paper and giving me the opportunity to present uh, on my Australian Research Council DECRA Fellowship research and it's, it's nice that the first time I report on this is, me is in Mexico. And also uh, my thanks to Jose and Fernando who've given me lots of help here. In fact, they helped me construct the installation in the patio, which you can probably hear now. Uh, and um, if you have any questions about that at the end of the session, I'd be happy to answer the questions. So I'm going to start with a video. Okay, so this is the installation that I'll be speaking about today. It's called Cold, and I completed this with uh, Remy Freer, a young artist from Melbourne, Australia, which is where I am from. The first thing to say is that uh, I'll be talking to ambisonics more in a intuitive way, or the way I apply it as an artist. I'm very interested in how we can generate new feelings and sense of connection in space. And I've seen some incredible presentations in the last three days, very technical, where I've learnt a lot. Uh, I don't bring that technical knowledge to the field, but I bring my installation practice and my desire to use those tools as a way to generate new emotion and feeling in space. So very quickly, some context of that installation. I curated an exhibition in Melbourne at the YSG called Translating Ambience, which is also the name of my research. I invited 12 artists, including myself, to investigate the role that the body plays when working with environments, when the end purpose is to generate artistic output. Cold was one of nine works selected for the show. Yes, I selected my own work. And its ambition was to translate the rivers and that should say snow, sorry about that. <laughs> 
of Australian highland country into a Melbourne laneway or alleyway. I'm not sure what the Spanish word might be for laneway or alleyway. Um, it's like a very small street with no cars, I guess. And I achieved this with technologies including ambisonics, hydrophones, photography and LED lighting. I just want to spend a little bit of time uh, discussing with you what is the translating ambience hypothesis before I show you how the work was created and the effects that it generated. The ambition is to discover a methodology by which the ambient expressions, such as sound and light, of wilderness or natural areas or environments might be translated into an urban environment. It achieves this through technological mediation that recreates environmental ambience in built environments or the urban. The methodology is primarily interested in the sensory phenomena of sound and light, but of course the other senses are, are equally important. The installation out here, for instance, also uses touch uh, and smell. So the ambition is that the translated ambience will produce affectivities to be affected by something, like a feeling, comparable to those found in nature, thereby providing an alternative approach to biophilic design. For those of you who haven't heard of biophilic design, it's essentially urban greening, so bringing nature into urban spaces. So I'm trying to find an alternative way to imagine that process. Just quickly on the difference between ambience and ambient. So uh, I get my definition from the, uh, the philosopher and sociologist Professor Jean-Paul Thibault from uh, Cresson Research Centre in Grenoble, France. He describes ambient as an adjective that's historically been applied for scientific purposes as a rigorous and precise term to describe the environment, such as the ambient sound, the ambient temperature, the ambient conditions, etc. So if you look up a Google search and put in ambient, you'll see all the lists and the way that the scientists use the term to describe objectively the environment. But ambience was and is used to describe feelings evoked in connection with the material conditions of space. It's, it's like an in-between or an embrace, a sensuality being held. So there's quite a big difference between the two terms. Ambience as theory and practice, um, particularly articulated by Jean-Paul Thibault, is grounded in fieldwork, it's interdisciplinary, and it retains a special interest in sound for reasons that Jean-Paul goes into, but I won't hear now. Thibault states that ambience offers an original alternative to traditional object-subject divisions and uh, sensual and intelligence dualism, mind and body. Ambience doesn't distinguish between nature and urban, but is concerned with the feelings evoked by different spaces. So it doesn't matter, in a sense, what the space is or how you describe it. Ambience is concerned about the emergence in between the connection of space and feeling. Okay. So, translating, why translating ambience? The terms nature and urban are coded. What I mean by that is that there's a lot of controversy about what is nature, what is urban. Do they exist? In the sense of the landscape, we can say the landscape is a continuum that moves across different environments. But we as humans code those environments. So we say, this is nature, this is urban. But in fact, it's problematic because you can always find features of the urban in nature and you can find features of the nature in the urban. However, what I'm interested in is how we, as humans, code those different spaces. And the coding is related to our cultural and political references, backgrounds, histories, etc. In their codifications, they have come to mean something very different to each other. Nature, a space of restoration and quiet, urban a space of busyness and economics and culture, etc. It, it, but it is their effectivities 
that are of interest to this research. How do these landscapes affect the body? And through artistic research, can we change those effects? I get my ideas for translation from the art critic and curator, Nicholas Boreard. He writes, translation always implies adapting the meaning of a proposition, enabling it to pass from one code to another. He uses as an example the development of Creole. So if you have two uh, peoples with two different languages coming together, they will develop a third language, a Creole. So they leave the original languages behind to create something new. He also says, since every translation is inevitably incomplete, it leaves behind an ir irreducible remainder. So, to translate ambience between environments acknowledges that one environment is not recreated in another, i.e. the ambition is not to recreate nature in the urban, but that new urban environments might be discovered by focusing on ambience. Of course, there is the big question of why would we want to do that, and which would be another presentation. There's many uh, reasons we could argue that. Maybe we, could, we can discuss that later, but I'll leave it there. So, the definition of translating ambience is a methodology that uses technological devices to render and reimagine the ambient expressions, particularly of sound and light, of one environment into another environment for the purposes of generating new ambience. This presents a new way of considering the introduction of nature into our cities by pursuing what I will call the creation of new natures. I'll talk about that later. Okay, so that's the theory. I hope that uh, was, was clear enough. Uh, that is driving my investigation. So I want to turn to the field work. I visited the highlands outside my city of Melbourne in a state called Victoria, or a region if you like, and we have highlands with snow and, and, and water. And I spent some time there uh, with my technology to, firstly I want to talk about rendering the ambient sounds. So this is the location. The resolution's not so great on the screen, but it's okay. Uh, it's uh, lots of gum trees, which are of course are a, a bit of a pest here in, um, in Mexico. I think they've, they, they, they're spreading across the land here, much like the Mexican feather grasses in Australia in the installation out there. But this is a, a natural environment in, in Australia and underneath that clearing there's a river running through the space that's quite hidden. So I spent a lot of time listening until I found the perfect location, bodily location, to hear this hidden river under the ground. And this is where I placed my ambisonic microphone to capture the three-dimensional um, ambient sounds of the space. I also use my hydrophones and drop them into four nooks or small openings in the ground and my ambition was to capture very different uh, water sounds within each nook or opening which I'll play you soon. And that gives you another example of two of the nooks. One on the left drops under the ground so you couldn't see it anymore but I had a small uh, Zoom H6 with headphones and I got on my knees and my elbows and got all dirty to find the perfect location. This is the recording kit, a 788T sound devices. Uh, I also had a Mix Pre 6 because two of the channels weren't working um, because I didn't have the right connectors. And I was using an SPS 200 sound field Tetra mic um, ambisonic rig. So these are the nature field notes. Um, if I wait. Yeah. So you can see the, the four nooks, as I've called them. So here's the ambisonic microphone where I was standing. And then we had nook one, nook two, and by nook, I mean like a hole in the ground where you could access the water. Nook three and nook four. This is circular because I actually used a dolphin ear um, microphone here, whereas these three were ambisonic, uh, sorry, ambient hydrophones. 
And here you can see the setup. So I had the ambisonic rig, the three hydrophones and the one dolphin ear, all recording at the same time. If you like to capture a non-human uh, listening environment, because it would be impossible for me to hear in the way that my technology can hear within the four nooks and the open environment at the same time. Now very quickly I also want to turn to the rendering of the ambient lighting with photography and LEDs which you saw uh, in the opening video. So I became quite captivated by the snow in this area. You can't see the snow in the first image but surrounding the forest there's, there's a lot of snow in this area of Australia. And as you zoom in of course you can see uh, the way the light refracts off the individual um, if you like particles of snow and as you move your head you get this sort of beautiful shimmering effect very much like when we're looking at an ocean when you when, when I look at that uh, what I see is the patterns at the ripples at the top of the wave when the white sparkles if you like from the Sun are generated it's quite hypnotic, they're beautifully spatialised. Not entirely different to the way that the snow refracts in my eyes. So the question then became once I had rendered my natural environment, how was I going to translate it into an urban environment? You've already seen the urban environment into which it was translated, the laneway or the alleyway. And in here we, I place the four air conditioners. If you see the, the four nooks here, one, two, three, four, we have the four air conditioners, one, two, three, four. So spatially the translation was almost exact, though at a ratio of a half, because the laneway was more narrow. And here is some, I was thinking about the lighting, how we we're going to play with the lighting and various things. But you can see the image, translate there. This is my daughter um, sitting in the middle of the space and here we have nooks one, two, three, four contained in old air conditioning units which you could say are natural to a Melbourne laneway because every Melbourne laneway or alleyway that you walk into you will see these you will see these air conditioners on the wall cooling a room but making a noise in the space. So I align them like this and inside they each have a speaker and an LED lighting rig. Just as a close up of the lighting So you can see here how I was trying to recreate or translate the lighting of the snow and of the tops of the water. And that lighting is actually synchronised to the hydrophone recording, which I'll show you in a minute. It was better by day because it was very subtle. At night it became like a big spectacle, which I'll show you soon as well. So I'll now turn to the sound. So I used a uh, Reaper and you can see here firstly that we have the, uh, the recording, the four channels of the Tetra recording here all being um, streamed or diverted into the Ambisonic rig and into Harpex which is a very good uh, Ambisonic decoder and I choose my input mode SPS 200 and what I did just solo this so this is just the sound of the ambisonic microphone capturing the river and what I chose to do in terms of my output mode is obviously there are different uh, binaural stereo around etc but I chose this shotgun mode 
because I like that I could really control uh, the listening experience in relation to the four nooks. So nook one, nook two, nook three, and nook four. So try to isolate them according to where the air conditioners are placed in the laneway. Uh, but without losing that sense of overlapping sound and connected sound. So that was that one. That's the ambisonic mic. And then in terms of the four hydrophones, I'll just play the four for you and you can see that I spent a long time carefully placing the hydrophones because I wanted to get four very different patterns, sonic patterns of uh, the water playing under the ground. So that's Nook 1. Nook 2. Nook 3. Dolphin ear microphone. So hopefully you can hear that they all have their distinct sound and patterning and, um, and, and expression. So with the four with the four air conditioners, one, two, three, four. You can see each of them have lights and the LED lights were programmed to respond exactly to the hydrophone recording. So each time there was a, a sound from the hydrophone, the LED would light. So what that means is when you get close to any air conditioner, it's, it expresses itself differently, um, but collectively it creates another expression as well. So I'll play this short clip which shows the whole thing in action at dusk, so it's much brighter and more expressive. So you can see in the background the traffic. So part of the idea here in creating these small meeting points or small sites of restoration in the urban is to try and respond or uh, change the effect of listening to traffic or other noise sources. It's trying to create more restorative or even meditative spaces where people can gather. And that is the ambience of the research, to create new feeling and new effect. So very quickly, I've two slides left. Uh, in terms of the new natures that I mentioned before, I actually uh, take that term from Henry Lefebvre. As you can see, I quite like uh, the French philosophers. And uh, he talked about the urban becoming a new or a second nature. He felt that that was a challenge, that we could create the urban in the way that art or artists create works. Why? Well, I presume it's something about making the urban uh, more creatively expressive and the type of effects that has for the people living in those spaces. So new natures fill an urban space with ambient expressions that produce effects which lead to new urban ambiences that are different to both the wilderness and the urban. There's no attempt here to recreate wilderness or to critique the urban. It's about discovering new environments. As Nicholas Boriar says, translation always leaves a remainder. We cannot recreate what was experienced. So I cannot recreate my bodily experience in nature. However, what carries over with the translation from nature to the urban is what creates the new. And what is responsible for carrying this over is actually the body or my bodily experience. So to represent that graphically, 
my last slide. This is a fairly poor diagram. It's the beginning. It will get better <laughs> with time. But essentially, this is to represent the urban. And inside, these are the ambient expressions of the urban. And oh, can I say I've really enjoyed the ambient expressions of the urban in Mexico, the fireworks, the sweet potato van, the whistle, the man playing the, the instrument. Um, it's amazing, very alive. And in nature, we have um, the ambient expressions of sound and light, etc. So these arrows here represent the body. And this is where it becomes ambience because my feeling in the urban I bring with me into the nature as I explore its expressions. And then those recordings and the photography I then take back to the urban in my intervention, such as this installation here or the one that you saw here. The attempt here, you can see that this is like a balloon or like you're pulling it out. So it's still the urban, but it's trying to take it into a new space where you have the mixture of the nature's expressions, the urban expressions, but they mix to create something new. And to do this, we need the body, but we also need technological mediation. So in conclusion, um, ambience is about feeling and interconnection. Nature, we can think of as being something that's restorative, that has lots of detail that we can explore, and that it, in, its in its aliveness, it gives us something unique. There's so much life, you know, the, the trees, the grasses, everything's alive. So a new nature is the question of designing urban environments that vitalise or reimagine what it means to be an urban dweller or what is and what can be an urban environment. And as I say, a fielding overlay out here is another example, of, another example of that. That was actually an installation in Melbourne designed for a specific space, and we've called it overlay because we've brought it here to Mexico as an example, as a live example. Um, yes, I, I think that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Any questions, queries? Please. Yes. Yes, of course. Thank you. So uh, my collaborator, Catherine Clover, is a sound artist from Australia. And we were uh, commissioned to create a work in the grounds of RMIT University, which is my university in Melbourne. And this particular space in Melbourne, it's quite noisy. There's lots of traffic and there's lots of um, buzzes and drones of gas, like um, gas and air conditioners, if you like. But it's a space where people assemble to eat their lunch. So we created an, an installation. I I should have put an image here. Uh, anyway, some people saw it at the Acoustic Ecology Conference. But the, the installation uh, was a wooden structure with many plants, and inside the plants were the same three speakers playing the sounds you can hear. And you'll notice that the sounds are uh, all um, sounds of the Australian soundscape, a mixture of bird sounds on one hand and a mixture of uh, traffic and industrial sounds on the other. And the idea is to mix and blend the sounds of the installation with the sounds that exist on the site. And by doing that, perceptually, you create a new experience or a new way of connecting. And indeed, we got lots of very positive feedback of people saying it felt like a much more pleasant or interesting place to eat their lunch. And it operated for four months, 24 hours a day. Four months, yes, yeah, so it was quite successful in the, in the sense that we got some good positive responses. So uh, I wanted to bring it here at invitation of Luz Marie Sanchez to uh, give an example of it. But of course, in a way, it doesn't belong here sonically uh, because there's a very different sonic environment. So it's, it's an overlay, it sits on top. But what we did do is we thought about the plants. We wanted to try and make that connection with Mexico. And what Kath and I discovered is that the Mexican feather grass covers approximately 14 to 100 million 
hectares in Australia, very similar to the eucalyptus tree from Australia that's in Mexico. And in fact, Fernando, uh, one, of the, one of the students who helped me, made a very interesting observation. It's, it's a non-human way of thinking about the connection between countries. So there's this connection between Mexico and Australia that occurs because of the plants uh, migrating and inhabiting the land. Uh, but in terms of the sound, there were 12 sound artists invited and to uh, respond to this theme of broken ecologies or non-natural ecologies that are a mixture of um, you know many things and then we mix those together into a three channel soundscape for playback is that enough of an explanation yeah. thank you anybody else okay thank you so much